What is up everybody? This is Mike with Tiny Life Big Mission and this week in the Word we are studying the history of the church and the origin of church denominations. Grab your word of truth and let's jump in. Welcome to This Week in the Word, where this segment of the channel focuses on a weekly Bible study where we share truth based on what the Word of God says. If you have questions about God or you are seeking truth, we welcome you. And I want to thank you all for joining today. I hope that this video is a good source for your personal studies. We are continuing our investigative study on doctrine in a series called Bad Religion, the Doctrine Behind Christian Denominations. This week's study will be covering a brief history on church uh, denominations and where they originated from. Now, just as a reminder, this video along with others like it have been grouped into a playlist called Bad Religion, which can be found under the playlist tab on our channel's main page. If you are new to this channel or are interested in understanding more about our position, please check out our quick reference video on our five guiding principles. I'll link that in the top of the screen here. Now we're getting to the main point of this study where we'll be diving into denominational traditions and doctrines and studying to see how they are each supported or conflicted in scripture. Now, inevitably, by the time I'm done covering every major denomination, I'm probably going to have some people upset. And it's not my intent or my goal, but there are people out there who care more about their denomination than what the Bible actually says. And inevitably, when I poke their denomination in the nose with the Bible, they are most likely going to get angry with me instead of taking a serious look at what their denomination teaches and reading their Bible for themselves and studying this out for themselves. Now, before we jump too far, I want to make a very important clarification. It is not your association with the denomination that saves you. Salvation is based solely on your belief in Jesus' shed blood as atonement for your sin. If you trust in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection as payment for your sin, then you're saved, no matter what denomination you are. And it doesn't matter how much your doctrine is messed up, what you believe, essentially, as long as you've got that point right. I believe that it is possible that there are many people saved in every denomination. There are many denominations that would totally disagree with this outlook, and that's just one of the reasons why I do not agree with denominations. So before we begin to look at the individual denominations of Christianity, I think it's fitting to first cover the origin of the church, which is what we covered last week, and the history of the church, or the origin of each major Christian denomination, which is what we'll be covering this week. Church history has a connection to world history. There are events that have taken place in history that have had long-lasting effects on religion as a whole. And I think it will be helpful to cover these uh, briefly before we move forward. We are going to cover a lot of history in a very short period of time. So think of this as like a 50,000 foot view level, like we're really up high. Also, it must be noted that there is a bit of disagreement to the history of the church. And because of events like the Dark Ages, the truth is most likely lost to history. History is not his story, as I'm sure you've heard the saying go. Uh, it is a story of victors. It's the people who were successful that get to write history. The losers do not get a voice. And if by chance they are allowed to have some sort of voice, if they're permitted, it is required to be in line with the narrative of the powers that be. So during the Dark Ages, when the Holy Wars were ongoing and massive groups of believers were killed by the hundreds, if not by the thousands, there was an unknown amount of history that was eradicated. So who knows what the real truth is, but the one thing that we do know is there's not one denomination that has it all figured out. What unites all Christians as a common group is our claim to believe on, trust in, and follow Christ. On a basic level, we all agree on who he is and what he did, which is he was truly God and truly man. He was born of a virgin. He died for sin. He was raised from the dead, and he ascended into heaven, and he will return. Now, some denominations will say that these beliefs were established at the Nicene Creed, and 
if you study this out, you'll learn that that's just not true. Otherwise, all denominations would date back to 325 AD when that creed happened. The Nicene Creed is actually the work of uh, the great Roman Emperor Constantine. Now, these beliefs are the common beliefs of Christianity because what the Bible says about them, not because some emperor of Rome and a council of men came up with them. So when looking at human history, there are three specific eras or points of interest that took place in history that had really long-lasting impact. In fact, it's, it's impacted on Christianity and how it looks even today. The first would be classic antiquity. Uh, there, this would be from 480 BC to 476 AD. And there's a lot that took place during this period of time. In fact, um, the classic Greek era, the Macedonia era, the Hellenistic era, uh, the late Roman Republic, and late antiquity all are encapsulated in this period of time. But the most important period uh, of this era that I think we need to, to look at is an era known as the Principate of the Roman Empire. This ran from 27 BC to 284 AD. So this specific era saw Jesus' birth, ministry, death, resurrection, as well as the first two centuries, almost the first three centuries, uh, of the apostles spreading the word and the propagation of the gospel and and all that that entails. Uh, this era also uh, was highly uh, governed as the, the world was highly governed as Roman Empire. And uh, because of the Romans were pagan, Christians were declared an enemy of the state, if you will, and were heavily hunted and persecuted during this time period. So there's a lot of history that could have been told if people had lived to be able to tell it, um, and if they weren't running for their lives at, while trying to spread the gospel, they, they might have had time to write more history. They just didn't write a, a lot, and what was wrote was either burned or uh, the people who could have told stories died before they were able to. So there's a lot that goes into this to consider. And again, we're not diving down into the weeds. I just bring it up because if it's a point that needs to be considered when looking at the history of church, uh, most people have been taught a history of their denomination as if it is the one and true only denomination. But there's not, if you start digging into historical evidence, there's not a lot there to support the claim. And we'll dive into this further as we go. But before we get there, I think it's important to, to see some of these things. So this is just one um, era, if you will, that I, I think is important to consider. The next historical point of interest is this big split you see happened between the Byzantine Empire and the Roman Empire. And it happened sometime around uh, 300... Uh, mid third century, you could say. There was a lot that took place during this era in this split in, in history as well. The reason why I call it a split in history is because there's two major empires that split and each side have a historical record of what happened and they both look very different when you start to dive into them. Uh, this piece of history is very, very bloody. There's a lot of things that are not told in the mainstream narrative that took place during this period of time. Um, some of the things that, that you could consider from this period would be the Dark Ages, the Viking Ages, the Renaissance era, as well as the Holy Crusades. Now, the Holy Crusades were uh, a big bloody war of religion. And again, we're not diving into all the details of it. Um, but there's a lot there that is lost to history because of the victors, the people who won those wars, were the ones who wrote the history of those wars. And they were very diligent about burning books, burning history, and essentially eradicating the opposing side uh, of their cause, if you will. And just in general, the Dark Ages were a period where there was a lot of wars inside of the European nations and the power of Rome and England, and th there's a lot there as well. So the reason why I bring this up primarily is because uh, 
when you're looking at the history of church, you can't separate it from the history of humanity. There are human events that took place, world events that took place that affected Christianity, whether it was affecting the gospel going out, whether it was affecting uh, the message being spread, the truth being spread. There was there's just a lot to consider. And the last point of human history that I want you to consider is uh, the the period known as the early modern period, which ranges from 1453 up to 1789 AD. This had a lot of turns in terms of it became a lot less bloody and more propaganda, the, the battlefront the for truth, if you will, and church history in that. Uh, so with the invent- invention of the printing press, which you saw in the 14th century, as, long, as well with the, the compass, um, which really changed the world scene. Like in this period of time is when the Americas were discovered and you had this big push with uh, world travel. People were able to navigate across the the seas because they actually had compasses now and there was um, means that, that were opened to them to be able to do so. So there's a lot that happened here in terms of technology. This was really the beginning of... Uh, engineering and and machines and things of that nature they hadn't quite come out that's the next period but they came out super early in the next period so they were in development toward the end of this period and it just really this as the technology came on things really took a a a change um and and it does have an impact in what we see in church history now, just to make it easy, I put all of this information on one slide if you want to take a screenshot of it to reflect back on as we move through our studies into denominations. It might be helpful. If not, no worries. There's just a lot to consider from history here, and I thought it easy to look at it all in one slide. So in this video, we're not really going to be diving into Bible study. There's not really much that you see about denominations in the Bible. They're extra biblical. But we'll, this will be definitely more of a history lesson. So if you don't like history, I'm sorry. But this is good information to, to understand as we work through this study. Now we're going to look at the divisions seen in Christianity, both the type of divisions and the motivating factors behind them. Again, remember, this is a really high-level view. I could easily go down into some some deeper details, go down into the weeds on these topics, but uh, we'll get there as we look at each individual denomination. I think another good thing to keep in mind is that this is all left to subjection. There's a lot of different opinions and theories in history. There's also multiple different sides to history, and people may grab onto one side of history and think that that is absolute where another person grabs onto something else that was written in history and thinks that that's absolute. Um, So there is, uh, I guess, some wiggle room in here that I'm not claiming to be spot on or anything like that. This is just the research that I've done. In this study, I'm going to be doing my best to present things as a non-biased, in a non-biased manner, as best as I possibly can, even though I do have my own opinions and understandings. Inevitably, somebody's going to disagree, and that's okay. Humans are prone to extremes, and there's always going to be an opposition to every side of every belief. This type of human behavior also will play a part in church divisions and into denominations, ultimately. And for this purpose of the study, I've categorized all the churches different divisions into three types of divisions. You have jurisdictional, confrontational, and organic. Let's go on ahead and start with jurisdictional. Now, jurisdictional is the type of division that you see, and it's pretty rare, but it's typically led by a government uh, decision where uh, something changes in a government and the, the especially back in time, the church was connected to the state oftentimes. So that meant the government or the parliament or the king or the emperor or whoever was ruling that nation had control over the church as well. They could choose what doctrine the church followed. And that's why we have church, a separation of churches and state in the United States as to where government cannot control 
the church. That doesn't mean that the church can't go into the government. In fact, most of those original original uh, presidents and the, the early forefathers of this country brought church into government. The separation wasn't for government's protection. It was for the church's protection so that the, the parliament, the presidents, the ruling government could not dictate religion to the people. And so back when they could do that, and different countries still do that today, but back when it was more common, you would see these divisional lines where, uh, like when the Byzantine and the Romans split, there was a division that happened based on the jurisdiction. And so uh, that is one type of church division. It doesn't mean that the churches disagreed in their doctrine. It doesn't mean that they had different practices. It just means that something happened and there was a line drawn where these guys belong to this group and these guys belong to that group uh, based on the jurisdiction of where they they lie at and um, it's not really common today but it it is part of the division history next is what i call confrontational division and this would include the holy war aspect of things where people were dying for their faith literally going to war you can't get much more confrontational than that um, but it also includes debate about doctrine that led to separation so you would ultimately see this look like uh, I, I think a perfect example is uh, martin luther in the catholic church Martin Luther was a Catholic priest, uh, a monk, I believe, and he was studying his Bible, which led him to see some count contradictions in, in the traditions of the Catholic Church compared to what the Bible said. And when he raised his concerns, he was ultimately uh, told to just shut up and get in line. I'm paraphrasing and making a very, very small <laughs> window of the story. It could go really deep here, but uh, essentially... He made a stand, and that stand was one of a confrontation. He he said, nope, I'm not agreeing with this, and uh, made a split. And so part of where you see church division or church denominations pop up is through these confrontational type divisions. The last is through organic. Uh, and this topic encompasses some doctrinal differences, but it's more, it's less of a we belong to this group and we have a problem with this group. And so because of our confrontation, we're splitting and we're starting something new. It has more to do with uh, taking bits and pieces and compiling them and kind of coming up with their own organic uh, hybrid denomination. And you see this a lot more the further out you go in history, closer to today. Um, originally you could probably say that most denominations were centered on one of four different beginnings origin points but there's a lot of denominations today that just organically happened whether it was somebody coming up with a new system of theology whether it was uh, people who were from different backgrounds who got together and uh, found a way to harmonize what they had learned um, there's a lot of different uh, outcomes in this, but it is a type of division. And I think, uh, and I could be wrong, but from what I've studied and what I've understood, pretty much all denominational divisions can be put back to one of these type of divisions. So those are the types that we'll reference as we look at each individual denomination as we go through this study. But the motive behind there, the different de denominational divisions, can range wildly. But again, this is just my understanding, my experience, my study, where I see the most division happen in, in all of Christendom comes down to two different um, polar ranges, if you will. The first one is based on the difference between tradition and Bible. I've put together a two by two matrix here to kind of show visually the, the different categories that can exist from these differing views. There's a hodgepodge of all Christendom that runs all over this entire board. But on the lower axis, you'll notice it goes from zero to 10, and that is covering the importance 
a denomination places in church tradition. What I mean by that is how the church operates and how it looks and the feeling of it. It doesn't have anything to do with theology. It's just the traditions that the church has come up with. And you'll see this in the Catholic, for example, you'll see a lot of high level placed in tradition. A low level of tradition would be what you'd see in a lot of modern non-denominational type churches where it almost looks like a concert is going on or somebody is giving some kind of TED talk or something. It has a very low church feel. The vertical axis, you'll notice, is the importance of the Bible. And this isn't the interpretation or the view of the Bible. It's just, do you place a high value on the Bible in general? And so you'll notice the the top left-hand quadrant is high Bible importance, with low traditional uh, view of the church. Non-denominationals tend to fall into both the the top left bracket and the bottom left bracket. They have a low traditional church view. Now, there are some that have a low Bible view, which is that bottom left-hand bracket. And so they, they don't view the Bible as super important, but it is it does have merit, it, it does belong, but they also don't have a lot of church value or church tradition either. If you look at the upper right-hand corner, you'll see that that's high Bible, high church tradition. The lower right-hand quadrant is low Bible with high church tradition. So I would say that there's a lot of variance in between what you will see and there are some people who ride the middle. You'll see some that do have a middle view on church tradition and a middle view on the Bible. And you'll also see that there are some that are extreme where they have very, very high church tradition with very low Bible. There's some that have very high tradition with very high Bible. There's some that have extremely high Bible with very, very low tradition and some that it's amazing they even call themselves Christian because they have very low anything to do with Christianity, which is Bible and church tradition. So it's all over the spectrum. And as we go forward in this study, this matrix will help to uh, be able to pinpoint where the values behind each denomination came from and, and to give them a little chart in your mind. As we continue, you will see that majority of church divisions come from a confrontational type of division or an organic type of division. And most of those divisions are connected to the the next slide that we're going to look at, which is the view of the Bible. So of the churches who you look at and compare the, their value of church tradition versus the the importance of the Bible, each one of those churches regards the Bible to some extent. They might have a low view of it, but they do regard the Bible. This next slide really separates everybody, and this is where you see the most um, division, and it's because of the view of the Bible. You'll notice that the horizontal axis from 0 to 10 is the measure of interpretation. This is how they view the words of the Bible. Do they take a literal interpretation or is it more of an allegorical type of interpretation? We would categorize the more literal as a conservative interpretation and the more allegorical as liberal. So the conservative interpretation would look at the Bible and say that it means what it says. The liberal interpretation would say some of the things recorded in the Bible may not have even happened. And if they did happen, it was more about the time, the era, that kind of thing. It really doesn't apply to us today. Now, the vertical measure of this matrix is the measure of divinity. You'll see that there is a range in what different denominations believe about the Bible from the original manuscripts or where God's word really was. And because we don't have the manuscripts today, we don't really have God's word today all the way up to the high point of this access being there's only one Bible that truly has the Word of God recorded in it, and that would be the King James only position. In the middle, you'll find people who believe that the Greek and the Hebrew are where God's Word is recorded because it was the original language, even though it wasn't the original manuscripts. 
and again, there's a vast variety on this as well. You'll find that people who are King James only, but they have a liberal interpretation of the Bible, meaning that they believe that the King James is the true word of God, but they don't necessarily think that what was recorded is exactly what God intended for us to understand from it today. One denomination that considers themselves to be Christian, that this would make a good example, or at least it's starting to make them a good example, would be the Mormon Church because they are starting. They used to have a very conservative approach, but as time has gone, they've become more and more liberalized in their view. And then moving right to the upper right hand quadrant, you'll see King James only conservative interpretation. These are people who believe that God's word is the King James Bible and it means what it says. If you go down from that quadrant to the quadrant below it, the original manuscripts and conservative interpretation, there's a lot of reformists and things that will fit into this group here. Uh, and then the final quadrant, bottom left hand, you'll see the original manuscripts, liberal interpretation. These are people who definitely don't think that we have the Bible. And even if we did, it really doesn't matter. It's more about the lessons that were taught. There's some parts of it that are definitely men. They're not God. It's not divine. It's not inerrant. It's more about the moral principles behind what is said than it is what is said. A lot of the ecumenical movement and more modern denominations tend to be in this category. The view of the Bible slide that we just went over is probably the biggest division point that you see across the board when it comes to any denomination why they started, how they got started, it typically stems from from that particular matrix, if you will. The Bible used to be considered by all brands of Christianity, the earliest that you can trace them back, as an inerrant Bible, meaning it is without error the Word of God. Over time, the position of inerrancy fell And the more it fell, the more open it gave for interpretation uh, for people to come up with their own meanings about what the Bible is saying. And with that, you end up getting all different kinds of denominations because one person will say, well, this is what I think it means. And another person says that this is what I think it means. And so because the two ideas are different, they end up making a division. Now, as time has gone, you see that division become so much that there's so many different groups that are very liberal in what they think and very liberal in their view of the divinity of the Bible and even just what the Bible itself says, their interpretation of it, that they're they're able to go, well, we're close enough so we can have fellowship together. So you're seeing a lot of these divisions that happened Uh, between the 17th century and the 20th century start to come back around where they're uniting again, but it's not because of their believing the same doctrine. It's because of their doctrine is so far abated from what the Bible says that it really doesn't matter anymore. And it's more of a social club and they can just kind of join hands around the fire, so to speak. It's Really, like to me, that's the most important thing that we'll look at um, as we look at these different divisions because of it's the one thing that has caused the most division. And uh, it's interesting that in the Bible, the first thing that God shows in his kingdom being attacked and his creation being attacked is Satan coming and saying, Yea, hath God said, where he's drawing question to the word of God. You see that in Genesis chapter 3. And the thing that has caused more division of the church has been that same topic, the word of God. Is it really what God is saying? It's just interesting when you look at all the history and it, you, you see it, it just connects. It's, it's pretty crazy. Now, all denominations claim to be the one and only true church of Christ. And if you go out there on the internet, it won't take you very long and you'll start seeing that there's all different kinds of charts that will show that this denomination goes back to this place, it goes back to this place, which goes back to Christ. And so our church started at at Christ. And again, this comes out of the whole belief that the oldest is the best. So if we can prove that our church goes back to the date of 
uh, 30 AD when Christ's ministry was um, inaugurated, then we can see that our church is the true church and therefore it gives us some kind of uh, credibility, some kind of prestige as the one true one. Again, you're going to see this common theme of oldest is best when we look at anything, doctrine, anything, Christian history, church history, any of that stuff. And it's because of the way that men's logic works. But the Bible says that the the wisdom of this world is foolishness to God. So we, we we're, as we study, we're not going to look solely at it, but it is part of the equation. And we do have to see that men build their structures this way, and they should. I mean, if you're going to say my denomination is the right denomination, you should be able to connect it to Christ. I don't think that, honestly, there's any denomination out there today that is connected to Christ. There's too many world events that happened that displaced the Christian movement, and it always came back from the ashes because God's word is true. It's here on earth, and it's always going to be reverenced by somebody. There's always going to be somebody who will believe and follow God. But there are a lot of people who don't want it, and so there's this war that constantly is going. Now, again, I can get down in the weeds in all of this. The point is, is that each church should at least be able to connect themselves some way back to Christ's ministry if they're going to say that they are truly the the correct denomination. Here's an example of what I'm talking about. You see all these different little charts. Everybody has one. On here, you'll see the Baptists, the Jehovah's Witnesses, the Church of Christ. Uh, I can't remember all the denominations that this represents, but there's literally hundreds of them out there and they all show how their denomination is the right brand, the right mix of of that antiquity and and going back to 30 AD. Now, a lot of the logic comes from thinking that the church was created by Jesus when he had his ministry here on earth. So therefore, if you're going to be a church today, you need to be part of that church. Now, last video, we covered how the church existed prior to Christ. Um, God has, I mean, the word church, when you look at it biblically, and men want to define words a thousand different ways, that's fine. You can define a word however you want to define it. That doesn't mean that that's what it means. When you look at the Bible, the way the Bible uses the word church is basically saying a called out assembly of people to God, for God, by God. They are his people. He has separated them from the world for himself. That's what a church is. It's a collective group of people for God. And it has nothing to do with a building. It has nothing to do with an organization. It has everything to do with the work that God is doing in those people. Now, that being said, that church has existed long before Christ ever was on the earth. That church existed uh, several different times. You could argue there was a church before the flood. You could argue that there was a church uh, at, at Abraham. But I think biblically, the, the easiest way that you can place the church is at Moses. I mean, the Bible talks about the church that Moses was leading. So, in the Old Testament text, it doesn't like that was written in Hebrew. And in the, the Hebrew language of the Bible, it's Paleo Hebrew, that language is a dead language and it's a very old language. It doesn't have a ton of words. It has far less words that it uses than Koine Greek, which is what the New Testament was written in. And both of those languages pale in comparison to the modern day English that is spoken across the world. So, we have more words to use than what the the Greeks did when they were writing with Koine Greek, which had far more words than what the Hebrews did when they were using Paleo Hebrew. All that to say, the Hebrews didn't have a word for church. And so you don't see the word church exist in the Old Testament. The way it shows up is either congregation or or assembly, typically. There are a lot of people who like to say that the church began in Matthew 16, and for the sake of argument, we'll just say that's when it started. Let's let's say that that's when the church started. If that's when the church started, then what denomination of church was it? 
Every denomination claims that they're the, the church that started from there. As far as my studies go, there's not one church that dates back to Christ. And I put together a little chart, we'll go over it, and we'll spend the rest of our time in this study looking at that. So here you see Jesus at 33 AD. During that time, the Roman Empire was in place and they were the ruling empire of the world. Christianity was against their religious system. The Romans were pagans. They worshipped many gods. And the thought of worshipping one god was crazy to them. In fact, it was a charge against Caesar. That's why the Pharisees would come at Jesus trying to get him to say that he was God so that, in a sense, it would put him at odds with Caesar. And they knew that that would be a conflict that the Roman government would deal with. And they deal with it by killing him, uh, which ultimately ended up happening anyways. Not for those reasons, but that's what their attempt was anyway. I think it's important to know that the Roman Empire was that type of, of regime. They didn't like Christians. They would kill Christians. So if they found you, you were either getting fed to lions or put in the Colosseum or something along those lines. Now, that doesn't mean that there wasn't Christians that didn't exist back then or that, that they abolished all of Christianity. They didn't. They weren't able to hunt everybody down. But the people during that time who were believers were doing their best to stay hid and alive as well as spread the gospel. And at that time, too, the New Testament had just been written. Things were being propagated that way. Scripture was being copied and sent out. And so there's a lot to do with the manuscripts during this period of time as well. And what I'm saying is the work was heavy and technology was low and persecution was high. That was a bad combination for that era of history because there's not much that made it out of there. But we know Christianity survived because it's here today. Another major point in history that I want to call your attention to is 324 AD and 325 AD. So in 324, Constantine the Great conquered the other two factions of the Roman Empire and became the sole ruler of the Roman Empire. Constantine is painted in a lot of history and even some church history as being a good guy. You can look back and in history, it's clear that he tortured and persecuted the church. He was against the church. Now, supposedly, he had this big revelation where he became a Christian, but that is very questionable based on a number of different historic accounts. There are some historic accounts that will support it. And again, this is what I'm saying. History is fickle, and so it's very hard to go strictly off history because you could get so many different sides to things, and there's a mainstream wave, and normally the mainstream wave is supported by an agenda of the people who won throughout history. And so it's a tempered with account, meaning it's not accurate. But at any rate, Constantine was a pagan high priest. He was involved in all kinds of pagan sacrifice, worship, all kinds of stuff. Hunted Christians, killed Christians. Supposedly, when he uh, saw the vision of a cross in the sun, he had this big conversion and he went on to conquer all of Rome. He was already the leader of the pagan world, but he also wanted to be the, the leader of the Christian world. So he essentially made himself the first pope. This was done at the the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD. From what I was able to find in my research, there are four major denominational lines that claim to go back to the time of the first century or thereabouts as the one true church of Christ. And I don't think any one of these four are accurate in their claim, but from them you see a bunch of hybrids that come out later in history. So I've got these all separated by different colors. You'll see the blue, the purple, the yellow, the red. Those are the four main denominational breakouts. And then the green at the bottom are all uh, hybrid that have happened within the last couple hundred years at the very most. And uh, they tend to be a combination of some of these other groups. So starting off on the left hand, the blue group, this is the group that the Baptists claim, or people who are kindred of the Baptists would claim that their line goes all the way back to to Christ through the Anabaptists. And the Anabaptists uh, are documented as early as 
251 AD. Now, the reason why they you see so many different denominational names underneath this title is because of these people have been persecuted a lot. And so a group would pop up being led by somebody. They would typically call themselves after that person's last name, and they were a group that followed that teacher until they all got killed. <laughs> and then they would pop up somewhere else. Now, some of them have been around for a long time, like the Amish, the Mennonites. Those are groups that have managed to not get persecuted to the point of extinction. But a lot of these groups you may not even recognize just because they are a blip in history where they were around for a couple decades and then they were extinct. So out of that line, though, does come the Baptists and the Fundamentals and the Baptist writers and those kind of churches. The next group is the color purple, and that's the Eastern Orthodox group or the Orthodox group as a whole. I've kind of cataloged them as such, but there's several different types of Orthodox church. You have the Church of the East, which is uh, probably the earliest spoken of. That was at 431 AD. Then the Oriental Orthodox at 451 AD. All during this time, like the, the history books record the Crusades starting around around 1095. But if you look into history, you'll see that they started way earlier than that. In fact, you could go back to the Roman Empire and that was technically a crusade where the pagan ruling regime was stomping out anything that wasn't in agreement with their pagan worship. So at any rate, the big split that most of the Christian world knows of in, in Christian history or church history is the church split at 1054 AD between the Orthodox Church and the Catholic Church. Prior to this, they were one church. This was largely a jurisdictional split, and we'll cover that as we look into more of their history. But the Eastern Orthodox is not super common in America, even though it is the second largest denomination of Christianity in the world. Of course, the first is the Roman Catholic, and that's the group represented in the yellow. And from the Roman Catholics, you see a lot of different denominational divisions, like the Lutherans, Presbyterians, Calvinism, uh, Arminianists, Protestants, there's a bunch of them. They all came out of Catholic backgrounds. And again, most of those split types were from either a confrontational or organic type of split. And then lastly, we see over on the far right in the red, the Church of England. Now, this church has records of it uh, in the Roman providence of Britannia uh, as early as 3rd century. And at this point in time, or at that point in time, I should say, at the 3rd century all the way up to probably a around the 11th century, they were part of their own independent group. They were brought into Catholicism as the Roman Empire changed hands and England took power. And there's a lot of history where the ruling governments were Catholic governments. And so they forced everybody under them to become Catholic. There wasn't freedom of religion. If your country was conquered, you now were Catholic. And that's what happened with England. So they were shoved into Catholicism. And then there's a number of different reforms that happened under the English group of Catholics. So technically, I could put a white line showing the Church of England going into Catholicism around 10th century somewhere, and then coming out again at different various points between the 14th and 16th century as these different uh, groups of denomination. And then at the bottom, we have a lot of different hybrid, multi-denominational influenced denominations. And a lot of these could be argued by different denominations, whether they are even Christian or not, based on what they believe. We're going to look at all of these because these are all the main groups of Christian. If your denomination doesn't make it onto this list, I apologize. It would take me an exhaustive amount of time to cover every tiny pop-up denomination. Also, there's a lot of denominations that have existed in history that no longer exist because they didn't have stamina. They withered out and they disappeared in history, but they still existed. And there are still some historical record of them in, in even the modern ones. But at any rate, this is a list that we're going to use to cover for most of, I mean, we're not going to dive into the weeds on a lot of these, but the major ones we're going to cover in depth to where you can see what they actually believe believe and where they get those beliefs from. Now, there's probably a lot more that I could dive into in this, but I my my point in covering all this was to give you something to consider, to think about that might be outside of the box of what you would normally consider 
when you think of denominations and what has affected them and caused them to happen, caused them to change. And most of the influences, I mean, some of them are doctrinal, but a lot of the influences are less than that. They come more from uh, a tethering to history where the world events and things that were happening in history had an effect on how the development of Christianity was. It's interesting to consider, and it is definitely, if you if you start to consider these things, you will start to see how those different points have affected the state of the church today. And that's what we'll be talking about next week, because we're all out of time for this week. But before you go, if you want to know how to support the work that we do here, there are five easy ways. First is you can share our studies with those who you know who need the word of God. You can also feel free to share them on all your social media platforms. Second is to like this video if you found the content helpful. Third is to subscribe to our channel if you haven't done so already. These three actions help the algorithms of YouTube to help the word to go out. Fourth is through giving. The work that I'm doing in this mission field is my full-time job. I'm not monetized by YouTube and I rely solely on viewer support. So there's no gift that is too small. If you feel led to give, you can send your gift of support through through Venmo or Zelle. For Venmo, use a QR code that is on the screen, or you can search by email, which is how you will find me on Zelle as well. But most importantly, the biggest way that you can support this ministry is through prayer. James 5.16 says that the fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. People need truth and your prayers can help, so please pray for this mission. If you have questions or would like to share your story, the best way to communicate with me is by email, which is tinylifebigmission at gmail.com. I simply ask that you remember our five guiding principles before reaching out. And that's all the time that we have for this week. I hope to see you next week in this word. Okay, bye. Okay, bye.